it's, it's pretty important to get comfortable in the room once you come in. It'll take you an hour or two just to find the little spot on the couch, get their guitars out, get their amplifiers set up, get a drink, whatever, and um, tune up and just relax for a while because it's going to be a good hour and a half before we even get to the guitars and bass. We're listening for a musical tuning here. We don't have any tuners or strobe tuners, so we're just listening for a musical note that's going to be usable for us. Signal chain for the toms would have been um, Sennheiser 421, pointing away from the snare as much as possible, about an inch or two off the rim and probably about three inches above the tom. Straight into the console, into the Soundcraft desk. A tiny bit of EQ, removing some of the 500 frequency out of the toms. The 500 frequency is quite a awful frequency on toms. It's all cardboardy sounding, so you'd probably remove some of the 500. No compression, just straight. A little bit of EQ and then straight into Pro Tools. I think he might have had the. Uh, we might have started off with a donut on the snare to really mute the snare, but here we've taken the donut off. We're about to take the donut off, I think, so it rings out more. Yeah, there we go. Now it's ringing out. The guys are after a really kind of live, big ringing sound. So it might sound quite extreme there at the moment. By the time, but by the time you get the instruments around it all, it'll disappear quite a bit. Snare drum signal chain, SM57 on the top, SM57 on the bottom. The top mic went through the, the other knee, the other side of the knee preamp. Tiny bit of EQ, and then through the other, the other side of the 1178. Was, had a little bit of compression. The 57 bottom mic would have just been pretty flat, actually. Wouldn't have had any EQ at all on it. On the snare EQ, probably would have just had a little bit of brightness, a little bit of high-end brightness to it, and a little bit of bottom end, and maybe I'd taken a tiny little bit of the tubbiness out of it. But um, I probably would have used a EQ in Pro Tools just to just to remove some of the unwanted frequencies. The 57 underneath will capture the snappy snare, the wires, and that'll be there'll be two separate tracks. The top of the snare and the bottom of the snare. We'll blend those together later on. The top snare mic will have all the attack, the, 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 the stick on the snare head. So, and once again, it should be important to note that maybe the skins should be quite new as well if, when you're recording. Dead old skins that will give you no attack, so, you know, unless you like that kind of sound. But a lot of the times you'll get later in the mix and people, the drummer will be complaining that, oh, my toms aren't very attacky or, you know, they're not very forward, well then a lot of the time it's probably to do with the, the skins and, and the way he hits too, so always remember to hit them hard. As much stick attack as you can really on, on your drums, I think. Yeah, it's easier to dial out, but it's hard to dial in later, any of the attack. It seems to ring out better as well, the toms and the snare and the kick drum, they all seem to react better with a harder hit. Especially so, for rock music, we're talking a little sort of rock music here, that's more reference to this song we're doing too, so... Maybe a jazz thing might be a little bit more delicate, you know, which is fine. The signal chain for the kick drum is an AKG 112 through the Neve preamp and then out of the Neve into the 1178, one side of the 1178 Yuri compressor. Slow attack, fast release. It's a ratio of 4 to 1 and then straight into Pro Tools. We don't want to knock too much of the transients off at this stage. We want as much transient activity from all the drums. We don't want to be nulling the, any any of the contact of the sticks or foot on the kick drum. We don't want to be sort of cutting any of that out. We want as much attack as possible at this stage. Yeah, a slow attack won't take any of the transients. The initial hit and front end of the drum won't be really affected very much at all. It's a very slow attack on the 1178 when it's on the slowest anyway, so it's very soft. And a fast release will make the compressor just disappear really quickly. It won't hold the sound. It's only just flicking over. It's maybe only compressing maybe 2 dB, 3 dB at the most probably. Just to, just to add a tiny bit of flavour and colour, that's all that compression is adding. And maybe just a little bit of safety on the way into Pro Tools in case it hits it a bit hard bit too hard but generally the levels are kept pretty low anyway. The colour from the 1178 is quite unique it's a very slow compressor and it has a very vintage sound to it it's it's not a very fast modern compressor but it's great for kick and snare on the way into Pro Tools at least gives the kick and snare a little bit of flavour.
And just there, we're hearing quite a bit of room mics, I think, there too. There's room mics being used here at the moment. And there's a stair mic up in the stairs. Up here, there's a stair mic that we use to capture the ambience of this room. You can hear it. You can, yeah, it's dead there now. I was probably might have been mucking around with the, with the actual stair mic, the chamber up here, which adds a real John Bonham sound to the, the yeah. drums. We leave the big door open and put sometimes two mics up in the stairwell or one mic on figure eight pattern and um, just capture that for later use in the track. It really opens out the room and adds a huge amount of sound to the drums. By incorporating the, the stair chamber, we can open the sound out so it's almost like five times as big. Not always good for fast drums, but for slow drums, medium pace tempo drum sounds really good. The overheads are used AKG 451s straight into the desk, into the into the Soundcraft desk. No EQ. I didn't EQ the um, overheads at all. I'll leave that for later. And no compression, and then just straight into Pro Tools. And then in Pro Tools, I might just use the EQ3 seven band EQ just to remove some of the honkiness of the overheads. Now for the bass, it would have been straight out of the uh, bass guitar into the DI, and then from the DI out into the amp. And we would have just fiddled around with the amp for a little while and just got a decent sound. So there'd be two channels of bass, DI and mic. The DI I used was a DEX DI, DEX DEX, and that would have just come up straight through the desk. I probably just would have maybe used a little bit of desk EQ and a little bit of DBX 160X compression on it. Same with the um, amplifier would have come up through the actual desk and a tiny bit of EQ and through the other DBX and then straight into Pro Tools. The microphone on the um, base cabinet would have been the RE20. The RE20 seems to capture the full frequency of the base so the RE20 would be my first choice. I've just got to make sure with the DI that it's in phase with the amp and that just usually requires um, the use of the phase button on the desk just to see what gives the best um, amount of bass between the two signals. Generally you'd use probably the amplifier more than the DI, it just depends on the track. But you can always just nudge the um, bass amp a few samples to match the, the cycle of the DI anyway if, if it feels like it's a little bit, bit wayward in the phase department. Probably the amp would might be slightly behind because the DI is going to be there first. Signal chain for the guitar would have been a 57 an Audio Technica 4050 uh, condenser mic and maybe even a F Sennheiser 421. I might have had three microphones, always a 57 and the 451 90 degrees to each other and then the 421 maybe on one of the other speakers, making sure that the uh, microphones are the same distance from the cone to save any phase issues. It always sounds good to me. You might have to just flip the phase on the on the condenser mic, maybe. It just depends. But um, the 4050 and the 57 would be comped together onto one track, and then possibly the 421 might be on a separate track. But sometimes I might even bust all three microphones together onto one track. That just saves dealing with them all later. Just get the guitar sound then and there. For the vocals, we would have used the uh, Neumann TLM 103 through the Neve preamp. And then out of the Neve preamp into the DBX 160 and then straight into Pro Tools. No EQ, just straight up like that. As far as overdubs go, I, th I think on a track like this we would have um, overdubbed the lead solos and I'm pretty sure there might be a banjo being used with this uh, band here too. So the banjo would have been overdubbed. The headphone mix, we have four mono sends so everybody can be on a separate send. Everyone's getting what they want to hear so now we have everybody uh, with headphones on running through the first track and the sight lines are all good. Everyone can see each other. And even the guitar player, singer in the booth here, he can see everybody. We're trying to capture this song live and all this time I'm just checking my levels, making sure nothing's clipping out and just getting a general balance up in the control room.
so eager, so quick to hold on Find a decent thing and make it stick That'll do, that'll do, that'll do big Ain't mad at all, happened so fast Tried so hard but you came in last So what's the point when the race was rigged? That'll do, that'll do, that'll do big It's never been